Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're really happy today to have Roy Garcia. He's a graduate student finishing at Harvard University, and he's going to tell us today about the resource theory for quantum scrambling. Roy, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, so good morning, everybody. So today I'm going to tell you about my group's recent work. And this is work that I've done with my collaborator, Kai Feng Bu. He's a postdoc in our group and with my advisor, Arthur Jaffe. So I'd like to start off just by giving you the big picture of what we did. So pretty much we've developed this theory which can be used to define and measure this phenomenon called quantum scrambling. And then we use this theory to explain a recent scrambling experiment performed by Google. Now, I'm going to explain what this plot means later on, but just know that this is where we're heading. So we'll start off by just introducing some preliminaries. Then we'll use these to give some background on quantum scrambling. And then I'll introduce something called resource theory. Now, at first, it's not going to be clear why resource theory should have some connection to scrambling, but then we'll combine these two ideas to develop this resource theory of scrambling. So this is our first main result. And then we're gonna use this theory and demonstrate some applications in some quantum information protocols. So we'll start off with the preliminaries. We're gonna be working a lot with these Pauli matrices. So these are just single qubit operations. And we can combine these Pauli matrices in a tensor product to form a Pauli string. And in this presentation, it's gonna be convenient if we denote this Pauli string using a diagram that looks like this. So here we have this Pauli X operator acting on the first site, Pauli Y on the second, identity on the third, and Z on the last. So whenever we have an identity operator acting on a site, we're gonna color it white. Whenever we have a non-identity operator acting on a site, that's going to be blue. And the reason this is convenient to do is because it's going to help us define this poly weight. So the poly weight is just going to be the number of non-identity poly operators in a string. Or more intuitively, it's going to be the number of blue dots in our string. So for example, here, we only have three blue dots in our string, so our poly weight is just three. And later on, when we introduce scrambling, we're going to be working a lot with these local poly strings. So these are just strings which have one blue dot. They're localized. And we can also define the poly group on n qubits. It's just a set of all possible poly strings that you can write down. And later on, it'll be useful if we talk about these Clifford unitaries. So by definition, these are just unitaries which map a poly string to another poly string. Now, what I mean by that is if I take this poly string P1 and I evolve it with this Clifford unitary U, I should get back this string P2 up to some phase. And in this presentation, it's going to be more intuitive if we denote this process with this notation. So here U is just mapping P1 to P2. So we're going to take these preliminaries and now we're going to use them to explain what quantum scrambling is. And to do that, I'm going to motivate it with some example. So we're going to consider this random unitary, and it's going to have this brick layer structure. So each of these white bricks you see here just represents a two qubit random unitary. And we're going to stack these up, and we're also going to layer them. So here we have T layers. And you can think of T just as this time parameter. So as time goes on, we're going to evolve this unitary with more and more layers. Now, the question we want to consider here is how does this unitary spread out local information? And to answer that, we're going to look at the evolution of this poly operator here. So P is going to be a local poly. So it's going to have a, a blue dot just acting on the first site, poly X. And then to evolve it, we just hit it on the right with U, and we hit it on the left with U dagger. And the goal here is to find out what is the output operator of this evolution. And to do that, we just have to evolve the string layer by layer. So when we evolve with the innermost layer, 
we're going to get something that looks like this. So this unitary on top was able to propagate the information from the first site to the second. And once we evolve at the next layer, and this unitary is going to propagate the information from the second site to the third site. So as you can see, when we evolve with more and more layers, basically this localized information, which is represented by these blue dots, is going to propagate out. And this is called operator spreading. Now, not only that, but when we evolve with our unitaries, we can also get something that looks like this. We can map from one poly string to two. Now, you can imagine that if I just keep evolving my unitary with more layers, then eventually I should end up with a mapping that looks like this. So I'm starting off with this local poly string, and it gets mapped by U, which has many layers, and we should expect a sum of strings that looks like this. So here, two things are happening. First of all, U is going to increase the number of strings on the right-hand side to some large number. And it's also going to increase the number of blue dots per string to be large. Now, unitaries which do this are referred to as scrambling unitaries. And intuitively, we can think of scrambling just as this process which describes the spread of local information. So we've given this characterization of what scrambling unitaries do. Now, the next question you can ask is, how can you quantify the scrambling behavior? Can you write down some function? And traditionally, people describe scrambling by using this function called the commutator norm. Now, intuitively, this function is just meant to, you know, uh, give you a signature of this operator spreading behavior. So here we're going to have a commutator between some local poly Z operator and some time evolved poly X operator. And for convenience, we're going to take this unitary, which does the evolution, to have this brick layer structure. So again, here, T is going to act as this time parameter. So it makes sense if we look at what happens at time T is equal to zero. Well, intuitively, this just corresponds to the case where there's no layers since T is equal to zero. So effectively, U just becomes the identity operator. So our commutator here simplifies to this, and we have the commutator between two local operators. And the supports don't overlap with each other. So we should expect the commutator norm to just vanish. And we can also look at what happens at large times. So when T is large, then we should expect many layers in this unitary architecture. So now we want to examine our commutator. And we should expect it to look like this. So since this unitary has many layers inside of it, we've already seen that we should expect this local poly operator to evolve to some complicated sum of many poly strings that looks like this. Now here, there's gonna be a lot of overlap between the support of these two operators in our commutator. So we should expect this commutator norm to be large. So in this way, this function is measuring the spreading out behavior that's happening because of this unitary evolution. Now, schematically, we should expect this evolution to look something like this. So initially, we should expect this commutator norm to be zero for some fixed amount of time. And the reason you should expect that is because it's going to take time for this local information to propagate to the rest of the system. And after that propagation happens, then we should expect a spike in this commutator norm before it flattens out to some large fixed value. And when we get this value, this is an indication that there's a large amount of overlap between our two operators and our commutator. And typically, this is considered to be a, a scrambling signature. So we have this function which can quantify scrambling. The next question we can ask is, well, practically, how is it that we can measure scrambling in an experiment? And to answer this question, people typically deal with this function called the out-of-time ordered correlator, or the OTOC for short. So this OTOC is just some correlation function which contains U, which is the unitary doing our evolution. And it also contains these poly X and Z operators that we saw in the definition for the commutator norm. And the reason it's called out of time ordered is because of the strange ordering of this U and U dagger. So we have U, U dagger, U, U dagger. And effectively, 
Eudaga represents backwards time evolution, hence the name. So the reason we care about this OTOC function is because it's actually related to the commutator norm. It's just one minus this commutator norm. What this means is as this commutator norm increases, we should expect the OTOC to decay down to some value that's very close to zero. And when we measure this decay in experiment, then we can consider this to be a scrambling signature. So I've told you that this OTOC is useful because we can measure it in experiment. The next question is, well, how do you measure it? And if you look at this function, you might get this idea, well, I can just implement you know, time reversal evolution. What I mean by that is I can prepare some quantum state, evolve it forward in time by U, then evolve it backwards in time by U dagger. And you could do this, and it has been done in the experiment, but you'll run into this issue. It's that every time you evolve forward or backwards in time, you're going to be introducing noise. So effectively, we have two legs of noise going on here. And this is a problem because it turns out noise can lead to the decay of this OTOC function, but so does scrambling. So then we get this issue. Is this function decaying because of scrambling or because of noise? Now, because of this issue, we tend to avoid these time reversal protocols because we, we don't want to introduce more noise than we have to. So recently, there's been a lot of effort in measuring this thing without having to implement time reversal. And our group actually constructed a protocol a few years ago. It's based on shadow tomography. Now, all you have to know about shadow tomography for this presentation is that it's a technique which can be used to measure observables of this form. So here we have this expectation value of an operator O with respect to two copies of some quantum state rho. Now, if I want to use shadow tomography to measure this OTOC, then first I have to figure out how to write this OTOC as this expectation value. Now, it turns out this is pretty straightforward to do. You just have to take all these U's and U daggers that you see in this correlation function and you group them up and you just store them in some quantum state row. And then you take all the X's and Z polys that you see in your correlation function, you group these up and you store them in some operator O. So in this way, we can write the OTOC in this expectation value form. And once you do this, then you can apply this shadow tomography formalism, and then we can uh, just measure it. And here we have these numerically simulated measurements, which are the red dots, compared against the black line, which is the exact value of the OTOC. So this measurement technique does work and it can give you a good measurement. So the reason that we're interested in studying scrambling is because it turns out to have many connections to different areas of quantum information. So one of the most notable connections is that to black holes. Turns out black holes are these fast scramblers. This means that they can spread out information exponentially quickly. And it's also been shown that scrambling can actually help you perform this shadow tomography technique. And it's also been shown that scrambling is related to quantum state designs, quantum error correction, and also quantum machine learning. So there's many applications of scrambling. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about just one of these connections to show you the importance of scrambling. So we're going to focus a little bit on just quantum machine learning for now. Now, one application of quantum machine learning is using it to minimize some cost function. So here, just let C be this parameterized cost function. And the goal here is to find the value of theta, which minimizes C. So one technique you can use to find this minimum is gradient descent. So here, we're just going to randomly initialize some value of theta. And let's say that it places us on at this point of our landscape. And then we just compute the gradient at that point and we take a step down and we repeat this process. Compute the gradient at your new point, take a step down and you do this until eventually you find your way down to the minimum. So for this cost, this cost function that I wrote down, you know, this gradient descent technique works because you know, there's these nice slopes that I can move down. But it turns out that gradient descent can fail in certain circumstances. So let me give you a different cost function. Now it looks like this. 
So if I try to apply gradient descent to minimize this new cost function, something else happens. So I start off by just randomly picking my value of theta. Let's say it puts me here. And then I try to compute the gradient at that point, but there's an issue. So now this point is sitting on a flat landscape where pretty much this gradient is gonna be equal to zero. So I run into this issue. I don't know in what direction to move. I don't know if I should move left or if I should move right, if I wanna find my way down to this minimum. So effectively, I get this issue called a barren plateau in which my gradients vanish with high probability. And as a result, I can't efficiently find them in via gradient descent. So it turns out this barren plateau issue is a big issue in quantum machine learning. And recently there's been a lot of effort to try to identify causes of these barren plateaus. And it turns out scrambling has some pretty strong implications for this barren plateau problem. So to demonstrate, I'm gonna talk about a particular application of quantum machine learning. So we're gonna consider a particular learning task. So here I have this parameterized unitary U. Now, U depends on these parameters and I can tweak these parameters to basically change what this unitary looks like. So my learning task then is to train this unitary to look like some target unitary V. But we're gonna make an assumption here. So we're going to assume that V is scrambling. And in this context, what that means is V is going to be a hard random unitary. Now the goal is to make U look like V under this restriction. And the technique we're gonna use is gradient descent. Now, if I wanna use this gradient descent technique, the first thing I have to do is write down some cost function to minimize. So that's what we do. We let this cost function just be some expectation value of an operator O with respect to some quantum state rho. Now here, rho just represents some state that's prepared using my parameterized unitary. So this is the unitary that I have control over. And then we can represent O just as some, to have some dependence on V, this is my target unitary. So our goal here is to minimize this cost function. And the reason we care about the minimum is because this corresponds to the parameter set in which my parameterized unitary is equal to my target. So if I can minimize this function successfully, then effectively I can train U to just be V. But if you look at this cost function, you should be able to recognize some issue with it. It has a flat landscape. Or more explicitly, we run into this barren plateau issue. And the reason this is happening is because we made this assumption on V that it was a scrambler. And because of this assumption, we can't use gradient descent to efficiently learn scrambling unitaries. So this tells us that scrambling has very important implications in quantum machine learning because it leads to training inefficiencies. So that was a little bit of background on scrambling. Now I'm gonna introduce something called resource theory. Now to motivate this section, I just wanna start off with a question. How is it that we can define a scrambler? Now, earlier in this presentation, I gave you a description for what a scrambling unitary did, but I didn't actually give you a formal definition of what a scrambler was. And it turns out, if you wanna write down this definition, then we have to look at something called resource theory. So before I tell you exactly what a resource theory is, I'm just gonna give you an example of one that you're already familiar with. It's the resource theory of entanglement. So let's consider for simplicity, just some bipartite system. So I have qubit A on the left and qubit B on the right. And let's say I asked you to write down some state in which both of these systems were entangled with each other. So you might write down something like the Bell state and this could work. But now let's say I asked you to write down more generally a definition for what an entangled state was. Now, before you can write down this definition, first you'd have to define the set of states which are not entangled. So these are just the separable states. And these separable states could, for example, have a form that looks like this, in which we have a tensor product between some state on A and some state on B. So once you construct the set of all separable states, then we can just define an entangled state to be anything else which is not separable. Now, there's many examples of entangled states that you can have, 
And it's useful if I construct some measure of entanglement to find out well, which states have the most amount of this entanglement resource. And effectively, this measure of entanglement just acts like this measuring cup. It tells you how much entanglement resources in a state. And intuitively, this measuring cup should be empty for these separable states. And it should be full with something for entangled states. So the reason I'm calling entanglement a resource is because it has some pretty useful applications in quantum information. So for example, one of the most notable applications is that for quantum teleportation. So we have Alice and Bob, and it turns out if both of them share one half of the Bell state, so some state with this entanglement, then Alice can use this entanglement to teleport some quantum state to Bob. So entanglement is just one example of a resource. It turns out in quantum computation, there's another example of a resource called magic. And intuitively, magic is a resource which gives us some potential to provide some quantum advantage in quantum computation. And to explain what I mean by this, let's start off with some examples. So consider this quantum circuit here, where I have some Clifford unitary, and it's being applied to some input zero state. Now I can just measure the output of this circuit, and I can get some bit stream with some probability. And I can keep repairing this circuit, and I can keep measuring it, and I can keep getting different bit strings. And eventually, I should be able to construct some probability distribution using these bit strings. Now, it turns out that by the goatsman neal theorem, that the, these types of probability distributions, which are generated by these Clifford circuits, can be efficiently simulated on a classical computer. Now, if I can do this with a classical computer, then really what's the point of running this circuit on a quantum computer? So in quantum computation, really, we're interested in you know, finding these quantum advantages. What I mean by that is finding problems in which quantum computers can have some speed up over classical computers. But if we limit ourselves to only using these Clifford circuits, then we're always going to run into this issue that, well, anything can be simulated on a classical computer. So to go beyond the restrictions of this goatsman neal theorem, then we want to start introducing these non-Clifford gates. And one example of such a non-Clifford gate is just the T-gate. So it turns out if you take this T-gate and you pair it up with the set of Clifford unitaries, then you can generate a, a universal gate set. So it ends up being pretty useful. Now, so far, we've been talking about two different gate sets. These Clifford gates, which if used alone, provide no quantum advantage. And these non-Clifford gates, which do have a potential to provide a quantum advantage. So it's clear here that these non-Clifford unitaries have access to some resource which these Clifford unitaries don't have. And this resource is what we call magic. But there's many non-Clifford unitaries that we can choose from. And ideally, we want to work with those which have a lot of this magic resource. So it's useful then if we define some function to measure magic. And this is called a magic monotone. Now together, this function, along with the set of these uh, gate sets, constitute this resource theory of magic. So now we're ready to talk, to talk about the more general framework of resource theory. So when I say resource, I'm referring to some useful quantum process or phenomena. And we've seen how a resource can be either magic or entanglement, or it could be something else. And we'll talk about this later on. And a resource theory has three components. So first of all, we should be able to define a set of free unitaries. These are gonna be unitaries which don't have access to this resource. So in the resource theory of magic, the free ones were just the Clifford unitaries. And then we just define resourceful unitaries as anything else that's not free. And lastly, we should define some resource monotone, which is a function to measure the amount of resource in the unitary. Now, this resource monotone is a function which has to satisfy a couple conditions. It has to satisfy faithfulness. So this function should vanish for free unitaries. And it should also satisfy some invariance property. Now, we're going to take that resource theory framework and we're going to use it to develop a resource theory of scrambling. 
Now, the reason we want to do this is because it's going to give us a definition for what a scrambler is. And it's also going to give us access to some functions which can be used to reliably measure scrambling. And lastly, and most importantly, it's going to help us find more applications for scrambling in quantum information protocols. Now, when we talk about scrambling, we have to be explicit about what we mean by resource. So I'm going to take you back to a previous slide. So remember, we said that a scrambling unitary was one which had this type of mapping. And there were two things going on here. So first of all, this unitary had this ability to increase the number of strings on the right-hand side. So this is a mechanism that we call magic scrambling. Not only that, but this unitary could also increase the number of blue dots per string. And this is a mechanism that we're going to call entanglement scrambling. So now our goal, what we're going to do now, is take this resource theory framework and use it for each of these mechanisms individually. So we're going to start off with this entanglement scrambling mechanism. And the resource here is going to be operator spreading. So if we want to apply our resource theory framework, we have to follow our three steps. So first define free unitaries, then define resourceful unitaries, and then define some function to measure. So we know that if a unitary has access to this operator spreading resource, then it can do something like this. It can take the local poly string and it can map it to a different poly string with more blue dots. So a unitary which is free it doesn't have access to this resource, so it can't do something like this. It's always going to map us from a local poly string with one blue dot to another local poly string. So we know how these unitaries behave. We know how they map local poly strings. But the next question is, how can you construct these types of unitaries? And one can show that these free unitaries can always be generated by this gate set. So it's any gate that can be produced by single qubit gates and swap gates. Now, intuitively, the reason you should expect this is because these single qubit gates are always going to keep this local information localized. So it's never going to increase the number of blue dots in our string. And the swap gate, effectively, its role here is to just permute the position of this blue dot from here to here. So now that we know what the set of free unitaries looks like, then we can just define the set of resourceful unitaries as every other unitary, which is outside, outside of this gate set. So one example of such a resourceful unitary is just the CNOT gate, because you can't construct the CNOT gate by only using a tensor product of local gates and swap gates. So now that we know what both of these gate sets looks like, then we can define a monotone. So this is just a function which we call the polygrowth, which is going to be used to measure this operator spreading resource. So we define this polygrowth as just this maximization. So we're maximizing over the difference in poly weight. So here, this is the initial poly weight before evolution, and we have the final poly weight after evolution. So intuitively, what this function G is doing is it's counting the increase in blue dots before and after mapping. So for example, here, U is mapping a weight one poly to a weight four poly, so the increase is three. And that's what G is counting. And this polygrowth function has some nice properties. So first of all, it's faithful. This means that G is going to be zero if and only if a unitary is free. And it's going to be positive if this unitary is resourceful. So in this way, this polygrowth is measuring how good a particular unitary is at spreading out local information. Now, we define this function by using this maximization. But practically speaking, a maximization is you know, tedious to measure an experiment because there's exponentially many things you have to compute. So the question is, can we measure some bound on the polygrowth? And the answer is yes, you can. So it turns out that you can bound this polygrowth by using this OTOC on the right-hand side. And the reason this is useful is because we know the OTOC can be measured in experiment. So practically, by measuring this function, it's going to give you a bound on the amount of entanglement, entanglement scrambling resource in this unitary. 
So that was our first mechanism. And now we'll go into our second mechanism called magic scrambling. So the resource here is just going to be magic. And you'll see why in a bit. So we want to apply our resource theory framework for, for this mechanism. So we know that if a unitary generates magic scrambling, it's going to do something like this. It's going to take a single poly string and it's going to map it to a sum of poly strings. And a free unitary can't do this. So they can't generate magic scrambling. So we're always going to have these unitaries which map one string to one string. And in the introduction of this talk, we mentioned a set of unitaries which always did this. And by definition, these were just called Clifford unitaries. So the set of free unitaries is simply just a set of all Clifford unitaries. Now, by default, then, the set of resourceful unitaries must be the non Cliffords. And one example of such a non Clifford is just the T gate. So now that we know what these gate sets look like, now we can define our magic monotone. So this is a function which we call the OTOC magic. And the OTOC magic is defined as a maximization over some function of an OTOC. So on the right hand side, we have this function which can be measured in experiment. And later on, we're going to see that because of this definition, then this OTOC magic can be used to uh, give some explanation of some recent experimental results. So the OTOC magic has two nice properties. So it's faithful, meaning that it's going to vanish if and only if a unitary is Clifford. And it's going to be positive if a unitary is non-Clifford. So in this way, this OTOC magic can measure the amount of magic in a unitary. Now, the reason that we want to define a resource theory with two different mechanisms is because each of them is independent of each other. So let me give you two examples of what I mean. So remember that we have this CNOT gate, and we showed that the CNOT can be used to generate entanglement scrambling, basically because it's a two qubit gate. But we know CNOT is Clifford, so it's not going to be able to generate magic scrambling. And let me give you a second example, the T-gate. So the T-gate's non-Clifford, so it generates magic scrambling. But it's a single qubit gate, so it can't be used to generate entanglement scrambling. So here we have two examples of gates, which have access to one scrambling mechanism, but not the other. And it turns out, if I want to generate scrambling as a whole, I have to combine both of these types of gates. And that's why our resource theory has to encapsulate both of these mechanisms. So as promised, we can finally answer this question, what is a scrambler? Well, we can define a scrambler to just be any unitary which has at least one mechanism. So this unitary here can either have entanglement scrambling or it can generate magic scrambling, or it can do both. So the next question we can ask is, well, how do you generate these scramblers? What does the gate set look like? And to answer this question, First, we have to ask, what is the gate set for non-scramblers? How are these generated? And what I mean by non-scrambler is any unitary which doesn't have either scrambling mechanism. So we can see that these non-scramblers are always generated by single qubit Clifford gates and swap gates. And by default, then, a scrambler must be any unitary which cannot be generated by this gate set. So that's our definition. Now, that was our resource theory of scrambling, but now we want to show that this theory is useful to do something practical in quantum information. So we're going to demonstrate two applications. So the first application is going to be a theoretical one. We're going to show that both of these scrambling mechanisms can be used to recover information from a black hole. And the second application is experimental. We're going to show that our resource theory can explain some scrambling experiment. So Hayden and Preskill in 2007, they came out with this paper in which they showed that if you throw some quantum state into a black hole, then it can be recovered. And the particular setup they considered was they had Alice and Bob sitting outside of some black hole. And Alice had this diary, just some quantum state. And she didn't want Bob to read her diary. So she figured, I'll just throw my quantum state 
into the black hole to try to destroy it. And when she does this, she thinks her information is safe from Bob, but this turns out not to be the case. Because after she throws her state in, then the black hole can evolve with this scrambling unitary. And afterwards, it can emit radiation, which is then collected by Bob. Now, Bob can process this radiation to get his own quantum state. And it turns out, since this unitary is the scrambler, then Bob has a pretty good chance of making sure that his state is the same as Alice's state. So more exactly, Bob can ensure that he has a high recovery fidelity, where the re recovery fidelity is just the overlap between his state and Alice's state. So our contribution here is showing that both of our scrambling resources can be used to help Bob perform this recovery. And to do this, we consider our polygrowth function, which is one measure of entanglement scrambling. Now, in this context, this function G is going to be a measure of the amount of operator spreading that's going on inside of the black hole. So basically, how good is this black hole that's spreading out local information? That's what G can tell us. We also had this other function called the OTOC magic. And in this context, the OTOC magic is basically measuring how much magic is in the black hole. And we can show that both of these functions can be used to bound the fidelity F. And effectively, what this bound tells us is that both of these scrambling resources can help Bob recover Alice's state. So that, that's our first application. Now, our second application is an experimental one. So recently, Google came out with the scrambling experiment in which they were able to measure both mechanisms of scrambling that we've been talking about. And what made Google's experiment so novel is that they were able to use some function to efficiently measure magic scrambling. So effectively, what they're doing is they're measuring some function, which is here on the y-axis, and they're showing that it's correlated with the amount of magic in their quantum circuit. So this data tells us that there's some correlation that exists, but we were interested in understanding, well, theoretically, why should you be expecting this type of correlation? So what we did in our work is we took our resource theory and we used it to explain the signature of magic scrambling in their experiment. So more exactly what Google found, what they did was they measured this OTOC function for a quantum circuit. And they found that if that OTOC vanished with high probability, then this is some indication that that quantum circuit must have had a large amount of magic. Now, the reason you should expect this is because the OTOC has a nice property. So if I take this unitary to be Clifford, well, it turns out that the OTOC can only take on values of plus one and minus one. But if this unitary is non-Clifford, if it has some magic inside of it, then the OTOC can now take on intermediate values between plus one and minus one. And basically, what Google found is that the more magic I pour into this non-Clifford unitary, then the closer this blue dot should be to zero. So they're basically, they're basically exploiting this property of the OTOC to find some magic scrambling measure. So here's some basics behind their experiment. So they're measuring this scrambling phenomena in their Sycamore quantum processor. And they're generating these random quantum circuits. And to do that, they're basically sampling from two different types of gate sets. So we have access to these Clifford gates and these blue non-Clifford gates. So there's, a, there's an assumption here, though. There's a catch. So you can pretty much use as many Clifford gates as you'd like, but you're only allowed to use a fixed number of non-Clifford gates. So this parameter ND tells us how many non-Clifford gates you're allowed to use. So after you sample this random circuit, then you measure the OTOC for that circuit. Now, before I give you Google's actual data, first I wanna run you through an example. This is not gonna be real data. It's just meant to help your understanding of the data on the next slide. So first of all, we're gonna fix our parameter ND to be zero. What that means is we're basically gonna have a, a random circuit which has no blue gates. 
So none of our gates are non-Clifford. So there's no magic in our quantum circuit yet. So effectively, we're just sampling Clifford circuits. And what we'll do is we'll sample our first Clifford circuit, and then we'll measure the OTOC for that circuit. And then we plot it. So here on the x-axis, we have the value of the OTOC. And on the y-axis, we have the circuit instance. So it's our first circuit. So our circuit instance is just one. And then we plot that here. And then we sample our second circuit. And then we find the OTOC for that. And now let's say we get a minus one. So remember, since this unitary is Clifford, the OTOC is only allowed to take on values of plus one or minus one. So no matter how many times we do the sampling, this is all we should expect. So we repeat this process about 130 times, and then we move on and we update our parameter. So now ND is equal to one. What this means is I have a random quantum circuit and inside is one and only one blue gate, which has magic. So then I just repeat this process. I randomly sample a circuit. And now I find that the OTOC for that circuit is zero. And the reason this is happening is because now my unitary is non-Clifford. So it's not restricted by, not restricted to take, to take on a value of plus one or minus one. So now I can get something like zero. And then I sample my second circuit. See, I get a one and I keep doing this. And it turns out for the most part, I'm still gonna be getting a lot of values of plus one and minus one for the OTOC. And the reason you should expect this is that although U is now non-Clifford, it only has a little bit of magic. So it's still gonna behave mostly like a Clifford circuit a good amount of time. So then we update our parameter. We keep repeating this process over and over. So this is Google's actual data. So let's take a look at this first column here. So here on the x-axis, we have the OTOC value. And on the y-axis, we have the circuit instance. So it's pretty much the same setup as the schematic data that I showed you on the last slide. And this first column corresponds to the case where my quantum circuit has no magic inside of it. So here we can see that for the most part, the OTOC has values of plus one or minus one. And in the second column, this corresponds to a quantum circuit, which just has one blue gate. And now you can see that we're allowed to take on OTOC values, which are closer to zero. And as we move on from column to column, we're gonna be introducing more and more of these magic gates. And eventually we should find that when we introduce 32 of these blue gates, the fluctuations of this OTOC are gonna decay down to near zero. So in this case, the value of the OTOC is gonna be equal to zero with some high probability. Now it's clear from this data that the quantity of interest here is these fluctuations of this function. So we're gonna define a function called the OTOC fluctuations, which is just gonna be the standard deviation of this data. And that's what we plot on the right-hand side. So to get this plot, we're just taking, for example, all the data in the first column, finding the standard deviation, and we're plotting it here. And we do this for all columns of data. So clearly there's some correlation between these fluctuations and the amount of magic in our circuit, which is given by the number of blue gates. The question is why? Is there some resource theoretic explanation for why this is going on? And that's the question that we asked. So what we did then is we established an inequality relating our OTOC magic to their OTOC fluctuations. So here on the left-hand side, we have this magic monotone and it has this nice property, it's faithful. So what that means is this function is gonna be zero if and only if this unitary is free. And this makes it a reliable measure of magic. Now on the right-hand side, we have the OTOC fluctuations. So this function is not exactly a magic monotone because it doesn't satisfy this faithful property. But the nice thing about it is that it can be measured in experiment. And clearly it has some correlations with the amount of magic in your circuit. So what this inequality tells us is that when these OTOC fluctuations get to be small, then we should expect the OTOC magic to be large. And this is what we see in this data. Small OTOC fluctuations correspond to basically a larger amount of magic in your quantum circuit. 
So pretty much this inequality gives us a theoretical interpretation, a resource theoretic interpretation for why you're expecting this correlation in your experiment. So I'd like to end by giving some closing remarks. So I've shown you that we've taken our scrambling resource theory and we've given you two applications, but we should expect more applications because scrambling has many connections to very different areas of quantum information. So we're very excited about taking this resource theory and showing how our, our functions can be used to bound other properties in quantum information tasks. Now, we'd also be interested in generalizing this theory to include quantum channels because it's important to understand noise effects in scrambling. And lastly, we've showed a connection between this scrambling resource theory and the resource theory of magic. But we think that there should be connections to other interesting quantum resource theories too. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Roy, for a great talk. And I'm sure there's going to be some discussion. So let's open up the floor for discussion. People who want to speak, please turn on your video so we can see you. Thanks a lot. Who'd like to start? Well, you gave such a clear talk that there doesn't seem to be any discussion. Maybe you'd like to make some other comments. Well, uh, well, the big comment I want to make is uh, if you have any ideas on you know, how this resource theory is related to some applications that you're considering, then we'd be interested in finding out what they are. Um, basically, we're interested now in establishing inequalities using our functions that we've defined. Kaifeng, did you have a comment? Oh yeah, you know, I have several uh, some questions. Um, so have you considered like the um, like in infinite dimensional case, like for example the number of cubes tends to infinity, the thermodynamic, the thermodynamic limit. What's the situation of this of this result? Of well, I mean then your function should, well, at least when you measure uh, the monotone for your operator spreading should then be upper bounded by infinity because it basically, it scales with n. So, but this would tell you that there's basically like an infinite amount of resource that you can't have in a unitary. Um, so you'd get that. And Well, in what context would you want to consider this thermodynamic limit? Well, like you have a, a number of qubits, and then the number of qubits is, um, is very large. Right. Is there any particular like um, case where this would be useful? I mean, if you want to look at scrambling. Because a lot of times you're looking at many body systems, so we kind of assume n is large. So I guess it's kind of a reasonable limit. Yes. So in those in those cases, you should expect like the amount of resources available to be large. That's what well, I I'm, I'm not I'm talking about the amount of resources. I'm talking about the like the the OTOC. For the OTOC? Yeah, the, the quantum chaos. Well, not, if you if you can assume that you have like a, a many body non integrable system, then you should expect the value of the OTOC to eventually decay to something very very close to zero. Mm -hmm. Um, so practically an experiment, that's sort of the behavior that people look for when they measure this OTOC and this limit. Okay. And for like, uh, for the thermodynamic limit, 
case, um, is there any other like uh, measure? Any measure like that you can find? Yeah, for for talk or for uh, quantum chaos. The traditional one is usually the OTOC. Mm -hmm. You can also introduce tripartite mutual information, but uh, this one's common, but not as common as the OTOC. Um, these are the two big ones. Also, the average poly weight, which is the one we use that the one we use to define this resource monotone. Um, but I'm not sure if looking at the thermodynamic limit would necessarily help you define a new monotone. At least not initially. I wouldn't be able to see why that would help. No, I'm not. I'm not talking about it will help. I, I'm just talking about what's in this situation. How to define a like reasonable or useful measure oh, to quantify the talk of quantum chaos. Uh, so another measure of spreading of influence is the Lieb Robinson bound. Is that related to this measure? Right, so these Lee Robinson bounds give you, or it's like the, uh, you take this norm on the commutator between two operators and you can show that this has some, some upper bound, which, uh, which has some velocity. So, I mean, maybe Kai can answer your question. This is also, uh, this is also something that people use. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I should also say this. So when people deal with the OTOC, a lot of times you're interested in understanding the particular decay behavior of this OTOC. Um, because you can show that this behavior tends to be exponential for certain systems. Like uh, if you have these black holes, for example, then these OTOX are shown to decay with uh, these Lyapunov exponents. So this is these Lyapunov exponents tend to be a signature of this fast scrambling behavior, which you know people are interested in. So to go beyond the OTOC, you can consider specific you know decay dynamics of this function, and this gives you another perspective on chaos. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question is uh, like here you are considering the discrete uh, quantum K quantum system. How about like the continuous variable quantum uh, system, like the optics? Oh, that's a good question. Under like the uh, OTOG or magic OTOG, something like that. Yeah, well, this is something I started thinking about yesterday because there were some papers posted on the archive recently, which um, basically examine these continuous variable systems for the different applications. But I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you can generalize this this resource theory to these continuous variable systems. But it's not immediately obvious to me how you would do it um, because. Here we we based, we made this assumption that we're allowed to work in this poly basis, um, but in the continuous variable case, I mean you you basically have to work in a different basis. So maybe you can map it. You can find a similar mapping to find like these analogs for continuous variable systems. But immediately I can't see, I can't see how it would work out. But it's interesting to find out if you can do this. Mm -hmm. So if there's no other questions, I'd like to thank you again, Roy, for giving a really beautiful talk and uh, look forward to our next seminar. We're going to have a break for Thanksgiving next week. And unfortunately, the week afterwards, our original speaker had to cancel because of a colliding engagement. And we're trying to reschedule. So look for the notices that will come out in the mail. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye-bye.